Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight for our webcast, Working Cat Programs. I'm Jesse Guglielmo, Education Specialist with Natty's Fund. Our speaker tonight is Monica Frendin. In 2008, Monica founded a trap neuter return organization that sterilized thousands of cats called Safe House Animal Rescue League. To further reduce euthanasia, she then pioneered one of the nation's first and largest barn cat programs. Then in 2012, Monica moved to Texas and joined Austin Pets Alive, where she serves as a cat program manager. Since 2012, Monica has led her team to a 40% growth in cat adoptions, helped Austin achieve a citywide 98% live, 98 live release rate for cats, and oversees the adoption and care of nearly 4,000 cats each year. Before we start, let's talk about a few housekeeping items. Please take a look at the left side of your screen where you'll see a Q&A window. That's where you can ask questions during the presentation. Please get your questions in early, as questions submitted late in the presentation may not be processed in time for a response. If you need help with your connection during the presentation, you can click the Help widget at the bottom of your screen. This presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours should you wish to view it again. Monica, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I want to first give a shout out to you guys at Maddie's Fund and Jesse, our moderator here tonight. Um, thank you for putting this on and, and helping us to educate our shelter and rescue workers to help save more cats and all the work that Maddie's Fund does to, to help us all every day. And thank you to everybody who's joining tonight. I'm told we have upwards of 900 people registered, which is a little intimidating for me, but I am so glad that you are all here tonight and that you are wanting to learn how to save feral cats and barn cats and get these guys out of your shelter alive and into good homes, and that means the world to me. I'm so happy that you guys are all here. So let's go ahead and dig into it. So why are we interested in starting working cat programs? Feral cats are often, as many of you probably know, the very last to make it out of animal control alive. These are cats who have no other live outcome. They're feral or unsuitable for traditional adoption in their behaviors. So if they can't be returned to their habitat, they're usually killed at animal control. This is their life path out of animal control. I'm sure everybody taking this webinar tonight has attempted to socialize an adult feral cat at some point in their rescue career. And usually when I present this um, presentation live, we all kind of joke and everyone raises their hands and talks about their experiences trying to socialize an adult feral cat and how, how that went for them. Usually everyone shows me the scratches on their arm. But you all know that socialization of true adult feral cats is very, very hard. It's very time-consuming, resource-intensive. And even if you're somewhat successful with it when a, with an adult cat, you often end up with a cat who's kind of not 100% social or adoptable, but now he's not quite feral and you're stuck in limbo with what do we do with this cat. And then working cat programs are really inexpensive and easy to start. So here at Austin Pets Alive, our working cat program is hands down our um, most cost efficient program to run. That is, we spend the least amount of money on this program and it has a huge impact of saving hundreds and hundreds of lives every year. So this is a program that you can get started no matter what your shelter or rescue budget is. So those are all really awesome reasons of why we should and can start working cat programs. Thank you, Monica. Uh, to get us started, we have our first poll question. So here we go. True or false, a working cat program can replace a TNR slash SNR program. True or false, click on your screen instead of in the Q&A window. I'm going to give you a few more moments to go ahead and answer this question. All right. And we have our answer. It looks like everybody 100% are saying false, Monica. That is fantastic. So false is the correct answer. A working cat program or a barn cat program is going to be complementary to your trap neuter return or shelter neuter return program. It is not something um, that's going to ever replace either of those options. This is strictly for cats who can't be returned to their outdoor habitat. They can't be um, TNR'd. They have no habitat to go back into. The habitat is destroyed. 
um, someone is threatening their lives, you know, whatever it is, they can't be returned. So this, think of this program, a working cat program, is the very last resort for where to go with feral cats when they have no other option. So awesome, 100%. That's fantastic, guys. So let's talk a little bit about which cats are eligible for barn or working cat placement. So like we just said, they're not cats who can be TNR. These cats are unable to be returned to their original habitat. Um, oftentimes you'll get cats in a hoarding case that are feral and, you know, obviously cannot go back to their hoarding or go back to their home. So that is a place that we get a lot of our feral cats from. The cats should be unsuited for traditional adoption. So if they can, if these are friendly, healthy cats and you have capacity for them in your regular adoption program, this is a, a working cat program. It's not the traditional pl place that those cats would go. You have finite number of barn cat adopters, and so I like to reserve those spots for the cats who truly need it. And the cats should be capable of life in a managed colony. And so what I mean by that, too, think of it in terms of these cats are going to a caregiver. So they're going to have shelter. They're going to have food. They're going to have ongoing vet care. So when you're placed, thinking about capable of life in a managed colony, remember that someone is adopting them. They have an owner. They have an adopter. Um, so it's not as if they're not going to have, they're going to have to hunt for food or, you know, that kind of a thing. These guys are going to have an adopter taking care of them, so they only need to be capable of living in that environment. Some of the cats we don't consider for barn placement or are immediately not barn cat candidates for us are obviously kittens. If they're four months or under, we want to try and send them to foster to get socialized. Feral kittens, of course, usually come around pretty quickly if they're three months or under of age. And when they start getting beyond three months, it starts getting trickier. The quad cats we don't want to consider for barn placement right off the bat. Um, geriatric cats we don't consider right off the bat. And cats who can be returned to their habitat through TNR, obviously, are just not candidates for our barn or working cat program. That said, we don't have hard and fast rules if a cat is the clawed or geriatric and he's feral because you have to consider what other live options exist for that cat. So say you have a geriatric feral cat, what exists for him. You have to think outside of the box. Obviously, we don't want to euthanize that cat simply because he's geriatric and feral. We're going to have to think outside the box. With the clawed cats, behavior management and trying to, to fix those, those angry declaws um, is certainly challenging. And if it's a life or death decision, you can look for alternative placement in a working program for a declawed cat. Um, that may look like a warehouse or a retail storefront or someplace that's extra space for him. But these are cats that we generally don't immediately consider for barn cat placement here at Austin Pets Live. It looks like we've come to our second poll question for the night. What are placement options for a senior or geriatric feral cat? Here are the answers. Live out his life inside your adoption center. Working cat placement with special considerations and accommodations. Hospice care through your organization. Senior ferals cannot be placed or adopted. Again, please answer on your screen and not in the Q&A window. I also want to remind everybody uh, to get your questions in early so that they have enough time to be processed for questions at the end. Okay, and we'll go on to the answers. And it looks like we have, it says about 100% on the second answer and 7.7% on hospice care through your organization, Monica. Yeah, this is really awesome. You guys are already professionals at this. I don't know why I'm giving the presentation. <laughs> um, so mm -hmm. yeah, if you can find, if you can find special placement with, um, for the geriatric cat, that's fantastic. And again, that can look like a warehouse, a bodega, a retail store, any number of places that would want to take on a cat who needs a little bit more of a posh life. Um, we also do accept and keep um, ferals in hospice care in our organization here at Austin Live. That is something that we've started in the last year or two. Uh, we actually have the term hospice ferals now, which I absolutely love. Um, we're able to do that because we have really um, large and um, kind of fancy outdoor cat habitat for our barn cats here. Um, and so we do occasionally get a cat who's very, very geriatric and in the end stages of his life but is comfortable and happy. 
we can now let them live out their life in one of our enclosures and be totally comfortable. So if you have really great accommodations like that where you're still able to consider the cat's quality of life, you can consider hospice through your organization too. But I'm super glad to hear that no one picked senior ferals cannot be placed and adopted. That's fantastic. Also really glad to see that uh, we didn't have any results for people choosing that the senior feral cat should live out his life inside the adoption center. I think we can all kind of agree that that would not be uh, a super humane option for that cat's emotional well-being. Okay, so now we have the feral cats that we're going to look for barn cat homes for, and they're in the shelter. So how we handle them in the shelter is the first building block on your road to success here. So as most of you know, a stressed cat equals a sick cat. And when you have a feral cat that is sick, your treatment options now become really difficult. So imagine, maybe most of you have done this, trying to get medication down a feral cat. It's, it's not easy, and that is an understatement. So everything we do here at Austin Pets Alive is about reducing their stress to keep these cats healthy from the onset. And so what that looks like in terms of you sheltering them if you can come up with a dedicated quiet room that is just for your feral cat, that's the first key, and that's going to be a big piece of the puzzle. And a dedicated quiet room, it can be someone's office where you've got their cages or condos. It can be an old storage room, you know, a basement or unused part of your shelter or rescue or house, something that's a quiet place where there's not going to be dogs, there's not going to be people coming through, certainly not the public or visitors poking or looking at them. It's a place just for them where it's quiet and they're not going to be subjected to all those stressors. When you're talking about how to house them in the shelter, everybody should have a feral cat den, and I'm going to show you a photo of that on the next slide. Or if you don't have a feral cat den, we can talk about alternatives. But you want to cover up their condo if they're going to be confronted with a lot of people or other stimulus passing their condo by. And then keep in mind little things like the artificial light cycles. Turn the lights off when you leave at night. Turn them on in the morning. These are animals that are essentially wild animals, and they're used to living outside, and all of those little things now coming inside can trigger stress responses in the cats that make them sick. When we talk about handling the cats, basically picture that these are raccoons in cat suits. And think about a wildlife release, uh, rehab model where a raccoon comes in and is sick. You know, how do you treat that animal when you can't touch him? So a lot of this is going to be appropriate handling or a complete lack of handling. A lack of handling is always our goal with our barn cats here at Austin Pets Alive. When you talk about feeding of the feral cats, think about where these guys originally came from. These are street cats. They are used to eating out of trash bins or people feeding them. And usually I know when I feed my colony cats, I'm not buying them the most expensive grain-free option in the world. I'm, I'm picking up a 40-pound bag of, of chow at the grocery store. And that's usually what these cats like. So when they're under stress at the shelter, it's very, very common for them not to eat. So when you feed them, pull out the junk food. We call it, you know, the McDonald's of, of cat food. And feed those guys that. It'll keep them eating and encourage them to eat with all that, that delicious food coloring and salt. Um, and then the timing of food, it is not uncommon for these cats to eat only at night. That's when they're the most active and when it's most quiet in your shelter and it feels safe to come out. So make sure that you're feeding them the most delicious tamale foods, the wet foods and whatnot at night so that you can really encourage them to eat. A few things are worse than when a feral cat stops eating in your shelter. Then things become really difficult. So go into the, go into the situation armed with, I'm going to give you the junk food, I'm going to feed you at night, and just keep you eating right off the bat so you don't get to that point where the cat stops eating. And then the, the quicker you can get that cat in your door and out your door into an adopter's home is best. Obviously, the shelter is a very, very stressful place for all cats, even worse for feral cats. So the less time that they have to spend at your shelter or rescue, the better. And then if you can get outdoor habitat, that's always better. So we've got a few outdoor habitats here at Austin Pets Alive that I'm going to show you. And by far the cats who live out there, our barn cats, are the healthiest cats in our population here. They have almost no stress out there. They're in a natural environment. No one bothers them. It's in a quiet area of the shelter and tons of fresh air, and those cats are by far our healthiest. So it really, really cuts down on sickness and stress if you can get outdoor habitats for your barn cat or working cat program. If you can't, 
don't worry about it. You can still start a working cat program without outdoor habitats. It's just a nice goal to, to have this in the back of your mind that it's really going to help you. So these are the feral cat dens, which I mentioned. So if you have a feral cat or a cat suspected of being feral here at APA, you get a feral cat den in your house, in your condo. So these are about $75 or $80, and most shelters or municipal shelters nowadays are going to this, this um, feral cat den, and they're wonderful. So if you haven't seen these before, it's a little plastic den that's about cat size. It's got the little circular cutout on the side that the cat will go in or out of, and a clear uh, piece of plexi on the front. So this goes inside the, the cat condo, and the cat, the feral cat will zip right into that box because it is a nice, safe, dark little box for him to hide in. And when you have someone feeding or cleaning his cage, they can easily just slip that little circle closed to contain the cat. And then you can open the cage, you can clean the cage, you can even take the cat out and medicate the cat, whatever you need to do in his little box without needing to handle him. So these are expensive, but these are worth their weight in gold. There's a little link there where you can get them online. There's also many manufacturers selling these nowadays, but they all run about $75 to $80. Some of our options for housing the cats at the shelter. So on the right is what that feral cat den would look like in a typical stainless steel cage at the shelter. You can see the little cat tucked away in his box. So if I wanted to open that cage and feed or clean the cat, you could take a stick if you didn't want to open the cage, and you can just pop that circle closed, and then the cat would not be able to come out. The enclosure on the left is what we call our feral cat ISO unit here at Austin Pets Live. It was somebody donated that top component to us, and we just built a base onto it for about $50 so that they were out of the dirt and mud. And we use that if we need to house a sick cat inside, and you can even see there's a feral cat den in there. So this is an option to get things donated. Old chicken coops and contraptions like this thing on the left are always available on Craigslist or uh, FreeCycle. We get them donated to the shelter here a lot. And you can fashion any number of things up like that for really on the cheap. And those are great options to start your outdoor habitats for barn cats or working cats. These are two of our larger enclosures here at Austin Pets Live. The one on the left was built for us by Eagle Scouts. So hopefully your shelter has Eagle Scouts that are approaching you looking to do projects. If not, reach out to them. They're a great group of folks who do projects for nonprofits all the time. They spent about $700 on that condo or on that um, enclosure on the left. And it was an old dog run that we retrofitted and they put a roof on it. And then, of course, we had to go around and make sure it was cat proof. Um, got an elevated base so they're not in the mud and they built a little hutch inside so the cats have a little hutch to get out of the weather. The enclosure on the right is our large barn cat enclosure. This was custom built for us. This one costs about $1,500 in materials and Maddie's Fund has the blueprints for this if this is something you'd like to make at your shelter. The option on the right will hold easily 20 cats. You can put more in when you need to, but you can easily get 20, 25 cats in the enclosure on the right. It's about, well, I think it's 14 by 14. And the uh, habitat on the left is, I think it's about 8 feet long. And that will easily hold mm, 8 to 10 cats if we needed to. On both of these enclosures, if you guys would kind of notice some of the enrichment items that are available in there, in both spaces, the cats have lots of vertical space, lots of vertical space and places to get up high, and that is imperative to their stress reduction. Both of the enclosures also have the carpeted cat trees, and so if your shelter is like ours, we get a lot of used carpeted cat trees donated, and we can't use those in our main adoption center because we can't disinfect them, and we put them out with the barn cats, and so they will go up in those carpeted cat trees up at night, and lounge around like a normal cat, and they like those quite a bit. In both enclosures, there are some towers for them to get up high. On the enclosure on the right, there's little perches for them to go all around. Above the walk-in human door is a, um, a platform for them, and that's their favorite spot. It's way up high above everyone's head, and you can always find the bulk of the cats up above that door, and in fact, that enclosure overlooks Zilker Park here in Austin, where we put on Austin City Limits and all the concerts and South by Southwest, and so we always joke that those barn cats up there have the best views of the concerts, and for free. 
But there's also a hutch. There's a hutch for um, so they can get out of the weather, and it's insulated, and we can put straw in there in the winter. If you're in the northern climates, you can look at putting additional walls into one or more of the sides if you're looking for windbreaks. Here in Austin, of course, we have pretty mild winters, so we don't have to do much other than maybe put up the occasional windbreak. Um, but these are both awesome options if and when you're able to build anything at your shelter or rescue to house barn cats or working cats. What's also nice about having outdoor enclosure space like this is that we are able to take large groups of feral cats when we get an emergency call that there's a hoarding case that an animal control has just taken in. And so usually we'll get those once or twice a year, and it's always large numbers of cats, you know, 50 to 100 or more cats, and oftentimes we have to take them right away because the animal control doesn't have capacity for them. And so having the outdoor habitats like this is has really allowed us to say, yes, we can take those 100 feral cats that came from a hoarding case today. We have a place for them to go. Um, and having multiple enclosures like this allows us to kind of separate them out as we need to. So that's another really nice aspect that this is capacity within your shelter as well. Okay, so now everybody's favorite question is, great, so how do I find these homes for the working cats? And what types of homes am I looking for? So I use the term barn cat a lot because barn cats, is, uh, everybody knows what that is here in Texas. But working cats may be the more familiar term where you live in the world. But you're looking for barns, farms and ranches, stables, any type of factory or warehouse. We do lots of greenhouses and nurseries who want working cats. There is a really big growing trend for winery cats and distillery cats. There's some great uh, social media feeds for distillery cats and winery cats and lots of information out if you want to Google that about um, how cats are really helping the, uh, the wineries. Uh, junkyards, churches, storage facilities, any type of retail store or repair shop, and then even residential homes. So what I like to tell people is think about any type of place that has a rodent problem or a snake problem. Here in Texas, we have a lot of people who adopt cats for snake patrol. But think about anybody who has a pest problem that cats can take care of, and those that's your target audience. That's who you're going to market to, and that's who we're going to seek out and tell them that our program exists. All right. Looks like we've gotten to our third poll question. It's a true or false question. Cats who are FIV positive can be placed as working cats. Again, answer on your screen and not in the Q&A window. Okay, give you a few more moments to answer. All right. It looks like we have 100% for true, Monica. We have a phenomenal audience tonight, Jesse, and everyone knows all the correct answers. That's fantastic. I get this question a lot. Can I place FIV positive cats outside? Um, or more often we get an animal control who wants us to take that girl cat who's tested positive for FIV because they won't place it outside. So there's a ton of research on, on FIV lately, um, disproving a lot of the myths of yore. And we know that FIV is not, um, not something that's going to be spread very easily, and of course, because we are all responsible rescues and shelters, we are staying and neutering our cats before we're adopting them out. So these are cats who are already neutered, and they are going, not going to be mating, so they can't pass the FIV through mating, and because we're staying and neutering them, their inclination to fight is much less reduced. So FIV for us here at Austin Pets Alive is not a deterrent to them being adopted as working cats at all. So we will adopt out FIV-positive working cats all day long. So awesome job, everybody, on your 100% correct answers there, too. <clears throat> Excuse me. So rural options are our number one place, placement for cats. It is barns and ranches by far for us who are the overwhelming um, adopter of these cats. But for all of our adopters, we have some basic requirements if you're interested in adopting a barn cat. We want you to be off of busy roads, not have any recent predation, so coyotes or, or dogs or hawks or what, what have you. We want you to provide shelter to the cat, daily food and water. There is still in some pockets of society the folks who think that um, cats 
can live on mousing alone. And so we want them to uh, acknowledge that cats need daily food and water, or the cat is honestly just going to leave for someone who is providing them daily food and water. We ask our adopters to be responsible for long-term vet care as needed, and the adopters need to be willing to combine the cat for the relocation period. Suburban cats, we also do a lot of suburban cat placement, and this is um, this is an area that most people in our country can can find adoptive homes for barn cats. Everybody's got suburban areas. So if you've ever driven around and you see a garage door like the photo on the left with, the, with a few inches cracked at the very bottom, you can pick that person out as your local cat lover who is providing safe harbor to their neighborhood cats. I absolutely love to see those garage doors open like that when I drive around. Garage cats are really, really common. We have a ton of adopters who house cats in their garage in suburban neighborhoods like this. Um, if they back up to a natural preserve, if they're on um, a water, if they're on lake or creek or anything like that, they've got rat problems. Really, really common in a, for, for suburban people to want to adopt working cats nowadays. And more often times than not, they become garage cats. If you're going to look for suburban adopters, a couple of things to keep in mind is to make sure that their neighborhood is cat friendly. Um, some people like to, when they're setting out to adopt a barn cat, they think it's going to stay in their backyard or they may even say, well, my yard is fenced, they'll stay in, right? So, of course, the cat is not going to stay in even the fenced yard. So we'll make sure that their neighborhood is cat friendly first. And usually that's just a really quick conversation with a potential adopter. And we just ask, like, hey, are you, are you where this cat's going to roam up to half a mile in every direction? Are your neighbors cool with this? They're not going to mind that the cat may be out on their car hood one morning or scratching in the rose bushes. And we want to make sure that there's not a homeowners association that bans outdoor pets. And so we'll ask people to look into that. Um, more often than not, yeah, my neighborhood's always got cats. Everybody's got the same rat problems that I do. We're all on board with this. Um, but it's good to make sure that that is not going to be a problem before you place the cat so the cats don't end up needing relocation again. This is a great fit for cats who are a little bit more social. They're going to have a few more neighbors than somebody who lives very rurally. So if you've got some cats who are on the more social side of feral, this might be a really good option for them where they're going to get a little more human interaction. Urban cats are now a really growing segment for us, too. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard a lot about working cat programs in cities. Um, New York City has one, and Chicago has a very famous working cat program. And these are cats being placed in, in downtown cities. And so if, even if you're in a very urban location, you can have a working cat program. You're gonna, your housing is going to differ a little bit. Most people are not going to have barns and garages and storage sheds for these cats to live in. So you can retrofit cat houses to be like uh, the one on the left where you've got a bunch of crates linked together and you've got insulated houses inside the, the cat. You can be options like on the left, on the right, where somebody's made a little homemade option for the cat to get in and out of. But urban options completely exist for working cats. Think about um, all the rat problems that cities have and the money that cities spend on trying to rid rats from people's homes and workplaces. I think Chicago was voted the last several years as the rattiest city in the United States, so perhaps it's not a too big of a shock that they've got an outstanding working cat program going there with a, a long wait list of cats from all the people who want them. If you're going to do urban placements, I try to put cats who I know have come from an urban environment back into an urban environment, and my hope is that those cats are already kind of smart to cars, they're already familiar with roadways and how cars work and how to avoid them versus taking a cat that I know came from a rural environment and might not be as street savvy. So I try and match up urban cats to urban cats whenever I can if I'm doing an urban placement. So how to advertise to find all these places. So first and foremost, your website needs to have an online adoption application for your working cat program. And obviously, you're going to have a little section on your website that talks about what your working cat program is, what it's about, and why people need it. So your adoption application should be on your website. I like to have it on your website because it is so easy and convenient for people. They don't have to call to get a hold of you. They can just immediately decide, this is the program for me. I've looked into it. I want to move forward. They can put the adoption application in right away. It doesn't get any easier than that. 
and you want to make it easy, of course, for all adopters to do the right thing and adopt from your shelter. Newspapers are still a pretty effective means of um, advertising, especially in the rural areas of the U.S., where that is still a really um, frequently used means of getting the news. And oftentimes, your local independent newspapers will run an ad for you in their free space. And uh, we still do that sometimes here down at Austin when we, when we have an offer. Flyers are free to make or cost pennies to make. And I'll show you some examples of flyers as we go on here. But flyers are really, really effective. And think about anywhere to post them. What I like to tell people is imagine you own 10 acres of land. Where are the places that you would shop at? and post your flyers there. So you might be going to farm supply stores or feed stores, um, your Home Depot type stores, anywhere that you might go if, say, you needed to buy a tractor or some fence posts, where would you go if you had 10, 20 acres of land? Craigslist is our most popular method of advertising our working cat program. We post on Craigslist twice a week. We post in the pet section and the farm and garden section. You're going to get a very different audience in the farm and garden section of Craigslist than you do on the pet section of Craigslist. So on the farm and garden section of Craigslist, it's all people selling tractors and uh, livestock and hay and all those sorts of things where rural, if you've got livestock or you've got a farm or a ranch, it's a very different audience in the pet section. So we post twice a week in our local Craigslist for our working cat program, advertising our program, and definitely look at that in your area. Equine clubs and trail rides are another magnificent source of advertising your new working cat program. Your horse, local horse community are all animal lovers, and everyone who has a stable and horses does not want mice and rodents in their expensive horse feet. So you have a built-in audience that you're ready to provide them with the service that they already need. So definitely hook up with your local equine club. Farmers markets and county fairs are another awesome place for you to set up a table with your organization and talk about your new barn cat program. Um, at the farmers markets, you're going to also get an audience who is likely very interested in living um, with as little pesticide or rodenticide in their life as possible, so you can present your very friendly, eco-friendly, your eco-friendly, um, pesticide-free garden cat as a solution to their their pest problems. That works great at farmers markets. If your local radio station has a call in, sometimes they have segments where people are free to call in and talk about um, things maybe they're buying or swapping or selling or what events they have going on in their communities today. That's a great free way for you to get the word out about your Working Cat program. Next Door is a new way to get the word out about your Working Cat program, especially if you are a city or municipal shelter. Most Next Door, um, most, of, most of our municipal shelters can do a citywide post on Next Door. And so if you are a municipal shelter, you may have the ability to post to every single resident in your community who is on next door and talk to them about your new working cat program. And then all the little neighborhood groups that on Facebook that exist, you know, pet lovers or um, animals available for rehoming, whatnot, look, on, look for your local pet groups on Facebook and you can post there and talk about your new working cat program and cats that you have available for working homes. This is uh, an example of our adoption application here at Austin Pets Live. This is online. It's a very basic application. I'm only asking what I really need to know. I want to make it convenient and easy for people to adopt these cats. And so it has their basic name, address, phone number, email. The type of facility they have for the cats and some of the drop-down options include warehouse, farm, stable ranch, um, your basic options there, or maybe it's a residential home. I'd like to know what type of facility people have for the cats, because if they put down that they have a warehouse, that is going to alert me that maybe this is an option where I can place one of those special needs cats, maybe a declawed cat or a feline leukemia positive cat, or somebody who needs indoor placement but is still a feral cat. 
So basically if somebody puts down that they have a warehouse, we're going to get on the phone and call them right away and talk more about their warehouse situation to see if they're a spot where I can put some of those special needs cats. We ask how many cats they're interested in adopting. We adopt out a minimum of two cats at a time, so you can get two or more. We find that when you adopt out two or more, they have a much better success rate down the road of staying. These are cats who don't take any, com any um, joy from companionship of humans. They need species-appropriate companionship. Feral cats are pack animals, as you know from everyone who feeds colonies of cats. Cats run in colonies. And so they do much better if they're relocated with a friend. They're also going to be in confinement for a few weeks, and so it's important that they have somebody with them to keep them company, keep each other warm when it's cold outside, um, to demonstrate safety to one another. Cats demonstrate safety to each other. So if you have one cat who's less inclined to eat and he sees his buddy cat coming out to eat, that cat is demonstrating to him that it's, hey, it's safe, come out and eat too. So they do much better when they're relocated with a friend. We ask what you're going to feed the cats because we want to make sure that you are prepared to feed the cats and they won't have to live on hunting alone. We do ask if you've lost cats to coyotes or predators recently. We want to make sure that we aren't um, being irresponsible in our placements, of course. We started putting a new question on our application this year that asked, would you be interested in special needs barn cats? And there's a little line underneath that that says, and by special needs, we, we mean maybe it is a tripod cat who's missing a leg, or maybe it is a cat who only has one eye. And it's generally enlightening for us to see that about 50% of our applicants will put that, yes, they are interested in adopting a special needs cat. Um, and that was something I wasn't expecting, but it is, like I said, half of our applicants say that they they are interested in a special needs cat. And then the last box at the bottom of the application is my absolute favorite. It just says, is there anything else you'd like us to know? And people put the most enlightening information in this section, and I'm not sure if it's because it's a short, simple application and there's just a lot of info they, that they want me to know, but people will put down more info that I could ever get from them through standard question and answer. So this person has written down, I've got one and a half acres, I've got a corral that holds horses. They will tell you everything you need to know um, and often a lot more. This is a really good section um, to have on your application. I would de definitely recommend it. But whatever you're going to do, it's going to be on your website. It's going to be easy to find on your website. Don't bury it under 12 paragraphs of other text. Make sure it's easy to find. If someone wants to adopt a working cat, you should be able to get to your website and find it in a matter of seconds. This is what one of our Craigslist ads looks like here at Austin Pets Live. It's got a nice photo of a, of a kitty looking like he's out on a hunt for some, for some rooms. And it just talks about barn cats are looking for work. And it talks about why we have a barn cat program, that these are, these are outdoor cats who don't want to be friends. They're looking for a landlord only, if you will. And uh, we reiterate in all of our ads that these are spayed and neutered cats who are vaccinated, microchipped, and healthy. Um, very few people are in the market for intact cats who are going to have kittens upon kittens upon kittens. And so we want to reiterate that these are spayed and neutered cats. They're healthy, they're vaccinated, they're ready to go. That's a big appeal, obviously. But this is what one of our, one of our Craigslist ads looks like. And these are the ones that we post twice a week. Our team of volunteers who post these twice a week change up the wording. Um, they change up the photo. They make it fresh all the time. So twice a week Craigslist under pets and under farm and garden. This is what one of our flyers here looks like. This is the one I really like if you're at a farmer's market or maybe a nursery or greenhouse where you've got an audience who is very interested in non-toxic pest control. So... If you think about it, cats are the very old-fashioned, the very first pest control that ever existed. They are certainly green and eco-friendly. So this is a nice flyer that kind of plays on that thinking. I really like to have the flyers that have the little cutouts on the very bottom where people can tear it away and um, take away with your website that's going to link to your address. Um, this works a lot better than brochures because I think a lot of people are hesitant to take brochures, and brochures are also going to cost you a lot more in printing 
then these flyers will. So we print out these flyers and we can't basically put them up, like I said, anywhere that you could think to shop if you had 10 or 20 acres. And in, in Texas here, we've got mailbox banks down at the end of our streets and boulevards and whatnot. And if somebody on that street has adopted barn cats, ask them to put this flyer on their mailbox bank, on their community message board. Um, this is a great flyer, though, for those communities who value organic living. This is another flyer that we use a lot. We also hang these up in our regular cat adoption centers here at Austin Pets Live because I want people to know that if they're coming in to adopt a cat or they really want a cat who's outdoors 24-7, that they can still go home with a cat today. It'll just be this cat. And um, one of the other things we like to do is email a PDF of one of these flyers out to our volunteer or foster base. And it's a very small ask, and my email usually reads, like, you know, dear volunteers, don't worry, I'm not asking you to take home anything that, that's furry and, and meowing today. And I'm not asking you to get out your checkbook, so everyone please open this email. A small ask, if you could print out five or ten of these flyers and keep them in your car. And if you're going to stop at one of these places that you think might have an audience that would be interested in barn cats, would you mind hanging it up? It doesn't cost anything. It's a very, very easy ask for volunteers and fosters to do that. Um, also ask them, hey, can you guys hang this up in your work room or your break room at, long, at, at work? Um, you're going to get a completely different audience. But flyers are still a very, very effective place, uh, way to, to advertise barn cats, and it's a really great way to reach out to your volunteers and give them an effective means of helping you advertise. This is an example of a newspaper ad that we ran back in Illinois, my old organization there. Um, Mice in the barn, everybody has that issue if you've got a barn or a stable, or a ranch, and so catchy little taglines help. We talked a little bit about your friend the horse. So everybody in the world who has a horse needs a cat to keep the rats out of their grain. Um, horse people are already animal lovers, so these are already your, your, your inherent people that um, are interested in saving lives. They probably already have a cat or two, if not um, more, but they can usually take in another one. Um, riding clubs are great. Those horse shows are a great place. If you have a local um, horse show come into town, it's a great place for you to go set up a table and talk about your working cat program and go from stable to stable and introduce yourself and give them a little flyer. If you've got dressage barns or polo clubs, riding schools, all those things in your vicinity, you can certainly call them up and introduce yourself and talk about your new working cat program and see if you can collaborate with them. One of the greatest things to help you advertise your new working cat program is going to be your local media, your local television and radio um, These are media darlings. Working cat programs are media darlings. Um, and what I mean by that is the media loves to do pieces on working cat programs. I'm sure you've seen them in the news lately. They're kind of all the rage in, sh in animal sheltering. And I think why that is is because working cat programs really make sense to people. Most people who, if you, if people who grew up on with grandpa's farm, you, you know, you went out and visited grandpa's farm. Grandpa had a working cat on that farm. It was just common sense. If you have a barn, you have barn cats. And this, the media picks up on this, and it's, it's, the audience really likes it. And so the media is forever approaching us looking for barn cat pieces um, on how our barn cat program is doing here in Austin. And it is a really feel-good piece. The media likes to, you know, throw in after all the bad things that have happened every day in the world. It's nice for them to close with a feel-good piece. And the fact is that most people in this country aren't aware that feral cats are being killed in our animal control centers in every state in this country. And so when the media can talk about that and say, hey, these cats are actually killed, but here's this new program that's getting them out alive and is providing a really valued service to the community, that's a really easy piece for the media to pick up on and run with. And so when you get your barn cat program launched when you get home, this is going to be one of your allies to help get the word out to the community. 
And as you do that, we have something that our marketing team here likes to call stunt placements. And these are really high-profile placements that the media is going to be all about, and you're going to get a ton of publicity for. And I'll give you a few examples here. The one on the left with Alex and Boo, this is a, uh, a very large grocery store chain here in Texas who adopted some of our working cats, and they live out in the garden centers. They've got a very large garden center attached to the grocery store, and the cats are garden store, garden center cats. They've got the little sign up there, and people love them, and the store gets amazing feedback on those. Um, the, store is, the feedback in the store is actually that the sales in the garden center have gone up dramatically because everyone who comes in with children wants to see the cats, and so they get mom or dad to take them out to, to the garden center to try and find the cats. Um, so that was a nice opportunity for us to do a media piece with that grocery store chain and say, hey, this grocery store chain adopted from Awesome Pets Alive and saved a couple cats and how well it worked for them and how well it works for us and, most importantly, how well it works for the cat. The photo on the top right is some of our team when we adopted some working cats to the Austin Police Mounted Patrol. And they needed some working cats for their mounted patrol stables. And that was something that the media absolutely loved. They loved that these were now official police animals. These uh, working cats that we adopted are actually full Austin police animals, afforded all the rights of any officer. And so that was a really feel-good piece that we did, and the media was all about that. I think that one got national media um, but a lot of your bigger cities, you're going to have mounted patrol units with your police department, and so don't hesitate to call up your local police department's mounted patrol unit and ask if they've got some police stables that might be in use, um, maybe in need of adopting some working cats. And down on the bottom right is this cat who is lounging about in the sun, and she has every right to be as happy as she looks because she got adopted by a five-star resort here in Austin that um, has several, several acres on the waterfront. And so, of course, they, uh, being on the waterfront, they had pretty severe rodent issues and they are, did not want to use poison to deal with it. So they adopted six working cats from us. And the one of the cats is now so popular, she has her own Instagram account. Um, but this was another opportunity for us to do some co-media with that resort and the resort gets good media and publicity from this. Our shelter gets good media and publicity from this. And the word gets out about how this program exists. So these are all examples of stunt placements that your media team will absolutely love if you can line some of them. And what I recommend when you get your barn cat program going, you just open up Google Maps and kind of poke around and see what opportunities might be in your neck of the woods for some of these stunt placements. You know, do you have a very beloved local business who might be interested? Um, do you have a new business that's opening up? Do you have a new winery that's opening up? Um, is there some really culturally important um, location in your community that you could co-media, co co-brand with this um, to do a stunt placement and get that media and get that extra attention? So once we've found our adopters and we've got our cats and everybody's ready to go, these are the best known practices for how to actually relocate them to their new adopted home. So if they're going to live in a crate, in a, in a wire crate or a plastic crate, um, during their confinement period, that crate should be kept inside the location where the cats are going to permanently live. So imagine that the cats are going to imprint on this new facility that you're placing them in. So if you want them in the hay shed, put that crate in the hay shed where the, you want them to ultimately live. The cat should be confined for two to four weeks. And so we say that two weeks is minimum and four weeks is optimum. We don't mandate four weeks from our adopters because we find that two weeks is about the maximum that a lot of people can commit to this. Um, it, feral cats are very, very messy when they're confined, which is um, out of frustration. But they're very messy when they're confined, so it's, it can be quite a bit of work for folks to keep them confined in a crate for more than a couple weeks. Every day they have to be cleaned pretty thoroughly. Um, and if it's going to be cold or inclement weather, people are going to have to go out every day and change the litter, change the food, 
So two weeks is about the maximum that a lot of people are willing to keep the cats confined for. So when people come adopt, we'll tell them, hey, two weeks is the bare minimum, four weeks is best. And we ask you to do somewhere between two and four based on what you can do. We like to think of the two to four weeks as the honeymoon period. We tell people to woo the cats during that period and, and show them what a wonderful new adopter and a new home that these cats have. It's usually by feeding canned cat food at least once a day and gain, gaining the cat's trust a little bit and getting them into your sense of routine. And it helps if you can make a special call while you're feeding that wet food in case you ever want to get the cats back in at night or do a head count or somebody needs to be accounted for. You can make that here kitty kitty call that they've come to associate with the sound of a can of cat food opening. At the end of their confinement period, the crate door is just going to be nonchalantly left open and the cats will come and leave the crate of their own free will. Um, sometimes the cats will continue to go back into the crate even once they're free because they've learned that that is their safe zone where they get fed and watered. Um, so if you have borrowed a crate from us at Austin Pets Live, we tell you to go ahead and keep that crate for as long as the cat is using it and bring it back when you're done. But don't be surprised if the cat continues to use it after they're allowed out. This is what a relocation crate can kind of look like when it's set up. I call the box inside the Heidi box. This is really important to have the Heidi box. If, uh, if you want to send feral cat dens home with the doctors, you certainly can use that instead of the Heidi box. Um, that's a pretty expensive proposition to get into, though, if you're going to be sending feral cat dens home with the doctors. Instead, you can use any overturned cardboard box. And the important part of this Heidi box is that the opening of that box is going to face away from the opening of the crate. So on the photo on the right, you can see that that box faces the side of the crate and not the crate door. And so this is that the cat can go inside of that box and it can hide and pretend that I'm not coming in. And I can open that crate door and I can change his food and bedding and water and litter. And I can do all of that without confronting the cat head on. So he's not even going to see me. He's going to stay in his little box in there and pretend that uh, pretend that this has been happening and I'm going to go away as soon as possible. If that box were facing me, if it were facing the opening of the door, when I reach my hand in, it would look like I'm coming right at that cat and that's when he would bolt out and run past my shoulder and escape. So really important that you have the Heidi box inside there. If you don't have a Heidi box at all, exactly what I just described is going to happen. The cat's going to freak out when you open that crate door and probably escape. So definitely give them the Heidi box. Put your food and water and your litter right up front so you can get in there and change those out daily. Of course, try and put as much space between your litter and your food as possible. A 42-inch Midwest crate or 42-inch crate of any brand is a perfect size for two feral cats. We like to buddy them up in the, in the crate so that they have that companionship. It is not necessary for the two feral cats to know one another, to be crated together. Um, these are cats who can communicate with one another. They speak cat, if you will. And adoption day is probably one of the worst days of their life where they don't know what's happening and they're terrified. And having a companion who speaks their language and understands them is of comfort to them and reduces their stress. So even if they don't know one another, um, one of the most common questions I get is, are they going to fight? And the answer is no, they're not. Um, if they are squabbling inside the crate, then I would encourage you to examine if those cats are really feral, because this trick will not work with domestic cats. You put two friendly cats in a crate together, they're going to, of course, hiss and snort and carry on. But two feral cats are both going to run into that hidey box together and bunk down with each other um, and use each other for comfort. So this is what the relocation crate looks like if you're going to be using crates. So let's kind of run through the whole process step by step how we do it down here in Austin and you can start thinking about how you might want it to work where you live. So step one, the application comes in, you're checking it for suitability, you're going to notice if there's any red flags and deal with those. If everything on that application looks good, the next step is that we Google Maps the address. So you can easily see from Google Maps what kind of a location this is. Is it off of busy roads? Does it look relatively safe? Um, the location on the right has got lots of trees, which I like to see trees. They're not required, but I like to see trees because, of course, cats can get up those and escape predators. 
Google Maps often has a street view, which is the picture on the left where you can get a really advanced view. You can see where the cats might be living if this looks like a fun area for the cats to live in. So that is our step two. We just Google Map the address that you've put on your application and check out that this is going to be a suitable location for the cat. Our next step, once your address and your application has checked out, we send you a detailed email. It thanks you for your interest in barn cats. It covers, again, that these are feral cats. They don't want um, attention from you. They, they usually can't be handled. They'll need access to a barn or structure or some sort of shelter. They need food and water. I'm basically reiterating all of the requirements of adopting a cat, a barn cat, working cat, um, and making sure that the adopter understands what type of cat temperament they're getting. And we, of course, put in again that these cats are spayed, neutered, vaccinated, and microchipped, and healthy and ready to go, and that there's no adoption fee. And then we throw in that these cats come from the euthanasia, group, euthanasia room of animal control, so you should feel really good about your decision to adopt some barn cats. We close this email out with a question that says, if this is all agreeable to you, please reply and we'll move forward. Um, I like to have that last little segment in there because I really want to make sure that people have read and understand the type of cat that they are applying for and the requirements of having that cat. So, I mean, most of us know people, getting, getting folks to read all of our information that we would like them to is difficult to fact. So this is a condensed form of all that information that I'm asking them, hey, you need to reply to me um, that this is exactly what you want and uh, that we're all on the same page. So the doctor will reply to that email, and here's where you're going to work out the details of whether you want to send the cat home um, via your own transport, whether the people want to pick the cat up. These are, this is where you're going to make all your arrangements. Um, here in Austin, we schedule all of our barn cat adoptions ahead of time. So that gives us time to go wrangle the kitties from our outdoor enclosures and have them loaded up and ready to go for the adopter. Um, it also makes sure that we have the appropriate staff to go out and, and wrangle the barn kitties and get them ready. You can choose to deliver the cats if you're so inclined. That's been pretty successful for some of our um, apprentices who have taken our barn cat apprenticeship here. And the downside to that is, of course, that that is a huge resource for you to be driving all around your state delivering barn cats. So you won't ever be able to adopt out the same volume if you're delivering, um, but it is a nice service that people, that people did like when we did offer delivery. And then the last step, we follow up with all of our adoptions at uh, one week out. For barn cats, we also follow up at three months and one year out, and we send a very simple survey that just says, how many cats did you adopt? Of those that you adopted, how many are still with you today? And if any are missing, what do you think happened to them? And we send this survey out so that we can improve our program, so that we can figure out, hey, how long did you keep that cat confined and what was your success rate and try and fine tune those details to come up with best practices. Um, but we also, it's important to know that the work we're doing has good success rate or what do we need to change. Um, we want to be responsible, of course, in all of our placements. And this helps us do that. Um, this helps us track how successful they're going at three months and a year later. And um, this is an anonymous survey that's just email-based. The volunteer runs this. Um, and you don't have to do this at all, but it's very, very nice um, to have this data. Thank you, Monica. That was all great information. Uh, we've come to our fourth and our last poll question. Um, of cats who went missing from their adopters, what is the greatest reported reason? And the answers are cat was killed by a predator, Cat was killed by a car. Cat is now living at my neighbor's house slash elsewhere. I don't know where the cat went. Again, answer on your screen and not in the Q&A window. Give you a few more moments. Okay, and we'll advance to the answer screen. Okay, it looks like you have 10% for the first one, Monica, 10% uh, for the second to last one, and 80% for the last one. Awesome. So everybody's gut instincts are pretty correct here. So I don't know where the cat went is the leading response. 
And that's not necessarily a negative outcome. I don't know where the cat went. Um, these are cats who are used to living outside, for the most part, cats who have landed in your working cat program. And just because the cat isn't present any longer is not necessarily a bad outcome. doesn't mean he's necessarily deceased. The second most common option is cat is now living at my neighbor's house. We do get funny emails and phone calls that, hey, the neighbor has stolen my barn cat again. Uh, she keeps putting out milk and tuna, and all my barn cats keep going over there. Um, that is pretty common. Um, I've had my own, my own colony of cats that have been uh, led over to my neighbor's house and uh, now live there. So it's even happened to me where the cats are just going to go wherever the proverbial grass is greener. So that's really common, too. This is kind of where our poll led to some interesting results for you guys. The next greatest reported reason is actually cat was killed by a car. Road risk is still um, up there as a potential risk, which is why we look at the distance to keep away from busy roads when we look at adoption applications. The least likely answer that adopters submit when they tell us that a cat was um, is no longer there, the least likely reported answer is actually that cat was killed by a predator. So of all the cats that we have relocated over the years, thousands and thousands, there is less than a 2% response that a cat was confirmed killed by a predator. So that is actually our least likely reported reason why a cat is no longer missing or no longer present at their adopted home. So some of those surveys that we send out are really important to know that, to have that data so that we know a program is working or maybe it's not working and that data is helpful for us to fix it. But what we know from over 3,000 barn cat placements here in Austin is that our long-term success rate, our success at one year later, is that 85% or more of the cats are still present a year later and they're thriving and they're doing well. And we know that predation is accounting for less than 2% of the cats who have gone missing. And the most frequent cause is that they ran away or living elsewhere. I don't know where the cat is at. And so while I would love 85% to be 100%, I think that is a fantastic number. And I always want it to get better, but I'm pretty pleased with 85%, especially when I consider what that cat's chance of survival would have been if we had left him at animal control. So I think if I were a feral cat, I would take an 85% chance um, of long-term success over um, an unfortunate situation of animal control. So definitely keep data as you start your barn cat program. It's not only going to help you fine-tune your program and make corrections where you need to or prove your successes, but it's also going to help you get grant funding when you look to um, pay for this program. Um, your grant funders are going to want to see how your program is working, and you're going to need that data to show them. And so I wanted to kind of talk about some of the successes of this program and other folks' success with this program. Maddie's Fund and Austin Pets Alive have had a working cat apprenticeship going on for a little over a year now where we've had awesome apprentices from across the country come spend some time with us down here in Austin, and we teach hands-on how to start a barn cat program. And I wanted to put in some quotes from our apprentice graduates about how their barn cat programs are going um, because I'm always afraid that I give this presentation and everyone thinks I can't do it. Well, all these people did, but I can't. And I want everybody to realize that this is absolutely a program you can go home and start tomorrow morning and you can do this no matter how much funding you have or how much space at the shelter you have. So these are some quotes from our graduates who have gone home and they've adopted out hundreds of cats. Um, they've got a waiting list going, even though their program just started a couple months ago. Um, 28, barn, 28 bar, barn cats adopted this month. Um, I thought it was really important to, to reiterate that this is something that you can do no matter where you are in the country. The map on the bottom right is a map of where our apprentices for the barn cat program have come from to date. And they, uh, as you can see, they're from all the sorts of different different states and different um, communities that have been wildly successful in getting their programs going. Um, 
definitely take to heart that this is something you can go home and start to do right now. If you are interested in the Maddie's Fund Barn Cat Apprenticeship at Austin Pets Alive, I'm sure Maddie has all this information right up on that website. That's going to be linked to this presentation, so definitely check that out. Um, and like I said, keep in mind this is absolutely something you can do as evidenced by all these beautiful little red states on the map of the right and all these quotes of people that report back that they are doing awesome. We're 12 weeks out and we play 70 cats. Phenomenal. So they can do it. They've done it. You guys can do it too. So let's talk about some FAQ before we get to our questions. Do we charge adoption fees? No, we don't. I would encourage you not to charge an adoption fee for your working cats. You're basically competing with free cats available on Craigslist or available online. So we want people to make the good decision to come adopt from your shelter and get a spayed or neutered healthy cat for free versus to go online and get a, an intact cat for free from somewhere and contribute to um, the homeless cat population outside. We don't charge crate deposits if you want to borrow a crate from us. Um, in all the years I've been doing this, I've never had a crate stolen from an adopter, so we do not charge crate deposits. We don't do home checks. We don't do them for working cats. We don't do them for domestic cats in our main adoption program. Don't do home checks. And we don't ask people to do excessive hoop jumping. So like I said, that information on that application is very short and brief. I'm not interested in what these people do for a living or how much income they have or, you know, what their childhood name was. I'm only interested in what I need to know. Who you are, where you live, do you have, are you planning to feed the cats and take care of the cats, do you have a suitable location? Super. I want to make it easy and convenient for people to do the right thing and help save these cats. Yes, we adopt working cats out all year long. Even in the winter when I was in the northern states, we adopt these farm cats out all year long. If you are already taking cats who have lived on the street, these are cats who already have their winter coats and they've already been living outside, so absolutely you can adopt them in the winter. To boot, now you're giving them shelter, sometimes in a heated barn, but these are cats um, who absolutely can be adopted all year long. Like we talked about, we adopt those cats out in pairs. They do better in two or more, unless you have that rare alpha tom cat who uh, will not tolerate a friend. Make the adoption super easy. Provide the tools that people need to be successful at this. So always offer your backup support if people have any questions. God forbid a cat escapes, um, cat gets the sniffles when he gets home. Make sure you're providing support for those adopters so that their long-term success for your cat is, um, is as best as it possibly can be. All right, we are at that time of the presentation where we are ready for some questions. Thank you so, Mon so much, Monica. Uh, that was all great information. I know that we got a lot of questions from everybody. We will try our best to get to as many of them as we can. With that, I'm going to go ahead and start with our first question. Okay, so our first question is, how do you pay for the vet care, food, litter, and advertising for this program without charging adoption fees? Yeah, that's a great question. <coughs> Excuse me. So most of the advertising that we talked about in this presentation is all things you can do for free. You can print those flyers out. You can post on Craigslist all for free. Um, you're going to get your information up on your website all for free. Thank God the media does not charge you to come out and do a story on your brand new program. Those are all things that are free means of you marketing this program. As far as food and litter, all of our barn cats here at Austin Pets Alive um, use our donated litter and cat food that's given to us. So it's a win-win because those cats also prefer the off-brands of cat food and grocery store brands of cat food. Um, whereas our cats in our main adoption center have a corporate sponsor who gives them nice green free food. So everything that we get donated, we're able to feed the barn cats. Um, not high expense there. For the litter, um, the litter can be pricey. If you are having to buy litter, what we like to do here is use all the brands and types of litter that we don't prefer to use in our main adoption center. Um, so if you've got, you know, the, the pelleted litter, or um, the wood stove pellets, that kind of a thing that you can use 
um, and get bulk and cheap. That's a great way to go about it. Vet care is obviously the biggest expense of this program. And one of the things that works really, really well for this, we work at Austin Pets Alive with a few shelters who do not have barn cat programs of their own, but they want those cats at their shelter to get out alive. And so one of the things we've done is partner with those shelters and say, hey, we can take your feral cats from you that otherwise would be euthanized in your care. Can you get them ready for us? Can you vet them? Can you tell them, here's what we need? We'd like them to be spayed and neutered, have a rabies vaccine, a CRCP vaccine, um, you know, flea prevention, whatever it is, microchip, whatever your, the vet package that you want is, to reach out to those shelters and say, hey, we have this new program. Here's what I need from you. And we work with a huge number of shelters who are more than happy to say, we can absolutely do that. We can fully vet those cats for you um, if you can take them for us. If you don't have that and you, don't have, and you need to cover those vet care costs on your own, I really strongly encourage you to look at grant funding for your new working cat program. There is a ton of grant funding available for working cat programs, especially right now. Um, Best Friends is a huge supporter of working cat programs. Obviously, our friends at Maddie's Fund are huge supporters of working cat programs. Lots and lots of grant foundations exist to um, help support innovative programs like these. If you're tracking your data, like we talked about, you're going to have a really easy time presenting to the grant foundation that if you give me $5,000, I can spay and neuter and vet, you know, 200 barn cats and get them adopted. And at the end of that grant period, I can easily show you that with your $5,000, I have gotten 200 cats out of animal control and placed them into adoptive homes. That's something that grant foundations really, really love, is to be able to support that their money is going to provable success. And so this program is really, really easy to get grant funding for. Our development team loves the barn cat program uh, because so much funding is out there and available for this program. So I hope that that helps. Thank you, Monica. That was great information. We have our next question. Have you correlated the 80% of don't know where the cat went with the length of time spent in an enclosure acclimating? Yes. So where we came up with the two weeks versus four weeks. So our data has shown that if you keep the cat confined for two weeks, down the road there's about a 75% chance that that cat will stay long term. If you keep your cats confined for four weeks, our data jumps up to a 90% success rate. And so when people come adopt, when they ask, well, what's the difference, two or four weeks, we'll even tell them that. We show that if you keep the cat confined for two weeks, about a 75% chance that cat will stay. If you can do four weeks, there's about a 90% chance that that will stay. And that can help encourage people to um, keep them confined for the, the full length of time. Perfect. All right, we're going to move on to our next question. How do you safely remove the cats from the feral cat enclosures without chasing? It is certainly interesting. Um, <laughs> some are more cooperative than others, for sure. So if you notice in our photos of the feral cat enclosures, um, the hutches all have little cat-sized doors on them. And one thing we like to do is line up a feral cat den or cat carrier to the exit of the hutch or the cat house, and we can try and shoo the cat into the feral cat den. And um, that's usually successful a good half, half the time. Um, if they can't be shooed successfully to go into a carrier on their own accord, then we do need to net the cats and we use uh, specifically designed um, animal nets, not fishing nets. The fishing nets can hurt cats, so you want to get a mesh net that is available specifically for this purpose. Um, they sell those at animalcare.net, too, the same place that sells the feral cat den. Um, so we get them to go in the carriers of their own accord, if at all possible, by just shooing them from their safe little hutch into the, into the feral cat den or carrier. And if that fails, then we do in, uh, have to net the cats. And we do have specifically trained staff here at Austin Pets Live who does that and who is trained how to do that with as least amount of um, time and stress on the cats as possible. All right. Here's our next question. How can we create outdoor feral housing at our shelter in the Northeast? 
where the temperatures for several months are brutal? Awesome question. So we've had some Maddie's um, apprentices come from the uh, Northeast, and we even had someone from Ontario come down recently. And they had the same concerns, and so we've worked through this with them. Um, some of the things you can do is you can repurpose a 10 by 10 garden shed or whatever size garden shed you have to be your barn cat enclosure and fence in an outdoor area for the cat with chain link kennel or, you know, um, horse fencing, whatever you can, build an outdoor area that links up to a shed or that links up to um, a garage bay or something. Um, our apprentice friends that came from South Suburban Humane Society in Illinois um, hooked up, made an enclosure for their feral cats from an old garage bay that they had because um, they were concerned about temperatures in Chicago in the winter. And so you can have outdoor space available to the cats without forcing the cats to live totally outdoors um, all season round. So if you're in the northeast, you're up north where it's um, frighteningly cold, give them outdoor access, but also where they can come into a building. So the, the, the cheap 8x8 eight eight or 10x10 10 10 shed um, works beautifully. And as long as it has a cat door and the cats can get in and out, that can be your outdoor cat enclosure. Perfect. Okay. How long does the working cat program keep feral cats at the shelter prior to adoption? Is there a time limit? So here in Austin Pets Alive um, and at many of our um, partners who now have barn cat programs up and running, most of the year we actually have a wait list um, of people waiting, adopters waiting for their barn cats to come in. So when we have a wait list, the cats are not kept at the shelter for a very long period of time at all, just long enough, long enough for us to fully vet them and to assess their behavior to make sure that they are an outdoor cat candidate. There is no time limit on any animal here at Austin Pets Alive. Everyone is safe until they find an adopter. Um, but normally, if you are starting a new working cat program, um, try and get them out the door, turn around as quick as humanly possible. Um, Time is a luxury that I know a lot of shelters and rescues don't have. So you're going to need to do the best you can on assessing their behavior and determining if they're really feral or not. Time is a really valuable tool for that, um, but it's, an, it's a luxury that we don't always have. But our goal here in Austin is to get them placed as quickly into an adoptive home as possible. And if that means we never really have to shelter them at all, um, that's even better. So we'll have some instances where we have people on a wait list to adopt their barn cats and we know we have vetted ferals coming in that day, and we'll all get those cats um, out the door the same day that they came in if we can. So as little sheltering time as humanly possible is best. Thank you, Monica. Our county has a no-roaming law for cats. How do I speak to that concern? Yeah, that is a that is a, a tough one when you get into legislative issues like that. I know Los Angeles County is dealing with the same thing. Um, so some of the things you can do are seek placements outside of your county. Um, and one thing you might consider doing if you're going to do placements outside of your county is look for volunteers who can deliver for you. So if you've got somebody who is, you know, it's too far to come to your shelter because you're advertising outside of the area, not a problem. We can deliver those cats to you. So you can advertise outside of your county, absolutely, for sure. Um, if, of course, if you've got some folks who um, are up for a legislative battle, definitely befriend them. But look at adopting outside of your area. Um, and secondly, you can look for indoor cat placements. There are not going to be as many of those by any account, but you can still place your cats in warehouses and storefronts um, bodegas, any number of those places where they're going to be retail, retail cats. Uh, we've placed a lot of cats as shop cats here in Austin, and they're strictly indoor. That's something that you can absolutely look into until you can basically get around that no roaming law in your area. All right. Here's our next question. If a barn cat needs veterinary care after it is adopted out, how does APA recommend the adopter handle retrapping? Does APA offer assistance? So if it needs veterinary care after it's adopted out, or even if someone wants to keep the cat current on vaccines, 
we recommend live trapping. So you're going to want to use a true catch or have a heart or, you know, um, a humane live trap. And we, when uh, people adopt working cats from us, we also give them information on our low-cost clinics in our area who do um, low-cost veterinary care or vaccine clinics and those clinics who are what we call feral friendly. So a lot of private vets um, are not uh, in the market for providing care to a feral cat. So we know who in our area is feral cat friendly, the clinic that knows what to do when a feral cat arrives in a trap and it needs its rabies vaccine. They're not going to balk at that. They're going to be able to get it done really quickly. So we provide that information to our doctors. Hey, if you need vet care, if you need vaccines, here's who we recommend in our area. Here's the trap that we recommend how to do that. We do offer assistance when we're needed to, so um, we are more than happy to offer assistance on any of our animals for the life of the animal. Uh, we also make an, a lifetime guarantee to every uh, animal in our care. So if the animal is ever not working out, we will absolutely take it back at any time. If we have to go get it, we absolutely will at any time. That just comes with, with the package for us. Um, and something I'm really pr- proud of here at Austin Pets Alive, um, our barn cats get the same quality of care and follow-up um, and love, really, that our friendly cats do. Um, and that was something really, really important to me. When I started here in Austin, I was always a feral cat lady, and I started at Austin Pets Alive as a volunteer for the barn cat program. Um, that's something that I carry with me strongly in my heart, that these cats are just as deserving of all of our resources and all of our time and all of our effort as a cat who lives in our house. And so absolutely we will make a guarantee to them that we will help in any way possible down the road um, if those cats ever need us. Thank you, Monica. Going on to this next question, I also want to say to you, Monica, before I launch into it, that we've also had several questions regarding if people can reuse some of your materials, like your advertising promotions. So if you could address that as well, that'd be amazing. Um, So here's this question. Our working cat program needs an application form for those applying for a working cat. Where can I find one or a template? Yeah, so if you want to go onto our website, it's austinpetsalive.org, and you will go to adopt a pet or adopt a cat and then adopt a working cat or adopt a barn cat. Um, You can find our application directly online. You can look at all of our applications or all of our questions and borrow them. Um, Free form sites are available at a multitude of places. You can use um, Google Forms is free. JOTFORM, J-O-T-F-O-R-M, is something that I've used, and it's free. We're currently using a free form site called Cognito Form, um, and I like that one a lot. But there are a ton of free form site builders and templates online, and you can absolutely go on to austinpetsalive.org and take a look at our Barncat application and borrow heavily from it. Thank you, Monica. That was um, so helpful. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, let me answer your Let me answer your question real quick about um, borrowing materials, speaking of that. So, yeah, not only are you guys all allowed to borrow those advertising materials and whatnot, but we would be honored um, to help you advertise your new program and to get these barn cats adopted out. Thank you, Monica. Okay, here's our next question. How can we mitigate the presence of predators in potential working cat program sites? In southwestern Ohio, coyotes have become common. SNP, Inc. has several working farm options for feral cats, but all have recent coyote sightings. Is there a way to minimize the presence of the coyotes? Yeah, um, great question. So one of the reasons that we always mandate that adopters have shelter for cats is because shelter is a great way to minimize the risk of predators. If a cat can get into, say, a barn or shed or garage and get up high away from the coyote, that is a fantastic way to minimize that risk. Um, There are, if you've got, like I talked about with trees, if there's lots of trees in the area, that's easy for the cat to get up to. There are things called coyote poles. If you don't have trees in your area, and it basically looks like a telephone pole just sank into the ground, um, and they're for cats to get up and get away from predators. Um, There's lots of information online on how you can deter coyotes. Um, 
through motion lights and whatnot. We have a lot of our adopters who tell us that they have or um, guardian animals, um, either Great Pyrenees or donkeys or llamas even. Um, those are all really awesome options for people who know how to um, preventatively deter coyotes from even coming around. Um, one of the things we've also kind of discovered is that kind of a natural cycle of predators, um, when we introduce cats to the area, those cats are taking care of rodents and vermin that the coyotes are also drawn to. Um, and same thing with our folks who adopt working cats from us for snake patrol. When we introduce cats to that area, they're taking care of the rats and mice that the snakes are drawn to. So those are all things you can look at. Obviously, you don't want to have food left out, uh, cat food left out if there's coyotes in the area. Um, we get this question a lot, how do I keep raccoons and skunks and whatnot from coming and eating the cat food? This applies to coyotes too. Make sure you just feed the cats during the day and pick up that food at night. That way the other predators, um, other unwanted critters are not going to come um, and be attracted to that cat food. So definitely Google how to keep um, coyotes away from your area though. Um, but having a having a shelter for the cats, a good a good place where they can get up high from the get away from the predators is really paramount. Um, and then see if any of those places that you're talking about your working farm options might possibly have or be interested in um, livestock guardian animals. All right. So this will be our final question for the night. Would you adopt out a friendly cat that was previously a owner surrendered outdoor cat? Would I adopt out a friendly cat? I'm not sure I understand the question entirely. Would I adopt out a friendly cat that was a previously an owner surrendered outdoor cat? So I think what we're kind of getting at here is would I adopt out a friendly cat? Um, I think if it so. was used to live, is, yeah, if it was used to living outside. Um, if the alternative is that cat is euthanized, then absolutely yes, I would adopt out um, friendly cats to be outdoor cats. Um, lots of friendly cats live outside. Lots of us have friendly cats that go outside. I don't have any ethical debate about friendly cats staying outside. Um, for us here in Austin, we, that's not something we have to do. Um, we're very fortunate in that case that, that um, we don't have to look into alternative placements for friendly cats. But if I were in uh, another city where friendly cats were still being euthanized and I had alternative outdoor placements for them, I would not hesitate whatsoever to place a friendly cat outside versus um, have it be at risk of euthanasia. Hope that answers the question. I think so. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, so with that, that'll be the end of our event this evening. We want to thank all of you for your time tonight, and a special thank you to Monica for an amazing presentation. Before I launch into a few closing remarks, I would like to ask all of you to click on the evaluation survey link that is on your screen. Um, while you do that, here is a quick reminder to keep checking Maddie's Fund's website at www.maddiesinstitute.org for upcoming webcasts in the new year. This webcast will be available on demand shortly, and we hope you will share this presentation on your social sites. From everyone here at Maddie's Fund, we want to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thanks again for being here with us this evening, and good night.